Well, good morning. It's a beautiful morning. And, and I know whenever you're tuning in and picking us up off the live or the video feed, uh, whether it's Sunday morning to you or Sunday afternoon, just want to welcome you. We are pre-recording this, but it's live and God's in it. And, and uh, we're recording Saturday morning and it's a beautiful morning on Saturday morning. Kind of feels weird. Uh, no, we're not going back to um, the Sabbath being the seventh day. Every day is our Sabbath or should be, right? But it does feel kind of weird. But we, we thought this would be a great experiment to pre-record. And then we pray and hope that uh, as it's put back on the video uh, feed that it'll be a, a clearer picture than live streaming and competing with every other live feed on a Sunday morning. Just a few announcements um, first of all, thank you for coming down to the church parking lot last Sunday afternoon. That was a blessed event. It was a great success, and it was good to see you. Hopefully, you would say the same about to many of us. It was just good that you came down, you took the time. We are actually thinking of doing another one, not next Sunday or, or tomorrow, but um, at some point. Yeah, in the in the month of May. So just thank you for coming down and, and being a part of our family. I want to thank you for your continued giving and using that GiveLify button if that's working for you or mailing in tithes and offerings. Thank you for your continued support. And thank you for your prayers, more importantly for your prayers and for uh, we're doing business as usual. Tomorrow afternoon we're going to do a crisis center ministry and hold a Bible study there, and so um, thank you for, for all of your prayers and support. We sent you an email. I think most of you got the email about, um, we haven't decided when we're coming back, and we just gave you some um, opportunity to respond. It's kind of our way of taking a pulse. And we've already gotten about 10 or 11 responses, so if you've not responded, um, we're just trying to get your input because you're a part of this. And uh, so email us back your responses about when you think for you it would be a good time to return. And we know that you're going to use discretion whenever we do set a date uh, in the future. Uh, you're going to use your discretion. But we just wanted to get a feel for what you're thinking about that. So you got that email. You've kind of failed to respond. Uh, please give us uh, even if it's just a little sentence. Um, so thank you for those of you who have responded to that. We're going to begin with prayer, then worship, and then we'll go into the word. Thank you for joining us. Father, we just come before you. We're always in your presence, whether it's recorded or live. We're, we thank you that we're always in your presence. And we just pray that our worship uh, today would just honor you that those at their phones or computers would just sing and worship you, that every day is a day of worship. Every day should be a Sabbath rest in, in some sort of that resting in you. Father, we just come before you this morning. We praise you for every blessing that you've given us. We know we're going through difficult times, and we've even emailed about different people that are going through some very, very serious times in their life, and we lift them to you. So, Father, as we worship you, as we spend time in the Word, as we just spend time together as a family, we just thank you for speaking to us through music, through lyrics of songs, through the Word, through just uh, words of encouragement, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Awesome ministry, awesome worship for an awesome God. Father, as we come before you this morning, uh, thank you for the awesome music, lyrics, vibrancy that is singing in your presence that revives us, puts our hearts and our minds in a different place in your anointing. And Lord, may your word put us in a different place. May trusting you be different uh, in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I'm going to talk about trusting God. And I'm going to read several scriptures and then launch into this message 
about what does it mean in my life and hopefully in your life to trust God at a deeper level, at a wider level, at a higher level than perhaps we've ever trusted him before. I'm going to read some famous or maybe not so famous scriptures that all have to do with trusting God. The first scripture is found in Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 that most of you can probably quote from memory. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. Daniel chapter 6 when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and after the angel had, of course, morning came and they rescued Daniel. And we read this verse. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of hurt, I love that phrase, no kind of hurt was found upon him because he had trusted in his God. Romans chapter 8, verses 27 and 28, great verses. Cardinal verses on trusting God. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that in everything, in every ingredient of our life, God works for good with those and for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Paul is giving a little kind of a summary of his life to the Corinthians. And he says this, We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of the afflictions we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly unbearably crushed that we even despaired of life itself, why we felt that we had received the death sentence. But that was to make us trust and rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from perils and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope. And finally, because I'm going to touch on this as a theme of trusting God is the great verse in Hebrews chapter 12, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run the race set before us with perseverance. Let me read that again. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So this morning, the theme is trusting God. I'm going to start with a famous story that uh, inspires me, challenges me, not because I'm into mountain climbing. I can think of better things to do on a vacation. But this particular great pastor and author, Presbyterian pastor Ben Patterson, writes in his wonderful book that I've used as a resource throughout a lot of years of my life, in his book called Waiting. He writes about an experience of climbing mountains in Yosemite National Park, and he was on a glacier with experienced mountain climbers, but he was on a glacier, and he was stuck, and he writes, he was scared. Though he had experience, he was not as experienced as his uh, friends uh, who were with him. I was only about 10 feet away from the safety of a rock, but one little slip and I wouldn't stop sliding until I landed in the valley floor some 50 miles away. It was nearly noon and the warm sun had the glacier glistening with slippery ice. I was stuck and I was scared. It took an hour for my experienced climbing friends to find me. Standing on the rock I wanted to reach, one of them leaned out and used an ice axe to chip two little footsteps in the glacier. Then he gave me 
the following instructions. Ben, you must, you must step out from where you are and put your foot where the first foothold is. When your foot touches it, without a moment's hesitation, swing your other foot across and land it on the next step. And when you do that, reach out and I will take your hand and pull you to safety. Then Ben, ben Patterson writes, that sounded real good to me. It was the next thing he said that made me more frightened than ever. His friend said, listen carefully. As you step across, do not lean into the mountain. If anything, lean out a bit. Otherwise, your feet may fly out from under you and you will start sliding down. So he writes this, I don't like precipices. When I am on the edge of a cliff, my instincts are to lie down and hug the mountain, to become one with it, not to lean away from it. But that was not what my good friend was telling me to do. I looked at him real hard. Was there any reason, any reason at all that I should not trust him? I certainly hope not. So for a moment, based solely on what I believe to be the goodwill and good sense of my friend, I decided to say no to what I felt to stifle my impulse, to cling to the security of the mountain, to lean out, step out, and traverse the ice to safety. It took less than two seconds to find out if my faith was well-founded. It was. Wow. Just even rereading that story, for me, gets me into the drama of what does it mean to trust God. It's interesting, isn't it? how we use that phrase in such a cavalier way. In fact, you might even find yourself singing or saying that phrase uh, probably at least once every day. I'm just trusting God in this issue. I'm just trusting God in this. Uh, I don't know about my finances, but I'm just trusting God. What I want to do, to, and I'm not putting that down. It's a good thing to say. It's a good thing, thing to declare. But what I'm going to do this morning is I wanted to say some things about what does it mean to trust God. And I'm not necessarily into acronym preaching, but in the, in the past several weeks, I, I've decided to take words and use the first letter of, of a word to kind of get me into a lead point. So I'm going to take the word trust. Five letters, so I'm going to take the word trust. And even though I was going to preach on the themes that you're going to hear, I'm going to use each one of those letters to start into the point and spell out the word trust. What does it mean to trust God? Well, my first point is this, letter T. Think deeper. Think deeper about what it means to trust God. One of my challenging points for me today, and hopefully for you, is to think and to pray deeper about what does it mean to go below the surface of the phrase trusting God and what does it mean to trust God? What does it mean to pray that? What does it mean to think about that? So let me give you some two or three scriptural examples and hopefully to cause you to think deeper about trusting God. First of all, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Very famous verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon your own understanding. I love that verse. I think you do too. But it always reminds me to think deeper. What does it mean to trust in the Lord and not rely upon what I did last week, what I did last year? I get it. God gives us common sense. Things that worked in our life a month ago are good. But what does it mean? How do I know that I'm really trusting in the Lord and not relying upon what I think is a good thing? That's always a challenge. I'm just trying to get you to think about going deeper. Um, for example, and I hopefully I don't do this, even though I will use old sermons, but this, for me this is a great illustration. Uh, I don't want to pull an old sermon out of the file and, and just say, well, it worked last year and ought to work this Sunday or this Saturday. 
I don't want to do that. If I'm going to pull something up that I've used before, man, I want to rework it, repray it, rebreathe it, relive it, um, because I don't want to just trust in what I did three months ago or a year ago. So um, what does that mean to you, to think deeper about not relying upon your own insight? I can't answer that in this sermon. I'm just trying to get you to think deeper. Here's a, here's a second scriptural example, is to think deeper when Paul said... In, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we despaired of life. We, we felt we received the death sentence, but it made us rely not upon our own strength and what we could do, but it really made us rely upon the power of God and what only he could do. That challenges me because there's a lot of things in life that I think I can do. Um, and, and I get it, you know. <laughs> I don't know if I can mow the lawn. God, mow the lawn. And God says, start the mower yourself and, and get it done. I, I get that. God gives us the strength and the power to do things. And yet there are so many things in life that we cannot do. How do you know that you're trusting in your own energy and your own stuff rather than trusting in what only God can do in your life? All right, the third thing that causes me to think deeper about trusting in God is this. Daniel chapter 6. It's called, it's called thinking deeper about your emotions. Daniel chapter 6, the famous story of Daniel being cast into the lion's den because he, he wouldn't stop praying. So we know this wonderful Bible story where Daniel was thrust into the lion's den. And then we read the end of it, Daniel 6, 23. I read it just a few moments ago where... The king sees Daniel in there, and the mouths of the lions are shut, and it says, no harm or hurt came upon Daniel because he trusted in his God. Well, what does that mean? So I ask you this. Think about that story for a moment. As Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, did Daniel, seeing those lions prowl around him, did he just go to sleep? I mean, it says an angel came down and touched the, the mouths of the lions. And I believe that literally happened, by the way. Did Daniel just kind of lay there and go to sleep and say, okay, God will take care of this. No worries. Did he? Is that the sign that you're trusting God that when you're totally at peace with something? Could be. It could be. It could be. Um, it could be also that you're living in denial. That, that something, that you're not praying through something and you're just hoping that everything works out. I can only challenge you with that. Or was Daniel, was Daniel in the lion's den? Did he get on his knees and did he say, oh God, they're pr prancing around me now. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm just praying, God, if you want to take me now, fine. If you're going to send an angel or shut their mouths or something, did Daniel stay up all night and pray? Did, did he live on the point of desperation? You know what? The text doesn't tell us. All it says is he trusted in his God. It could be that Daniel prayed all night. And through his prayers, the angel came. Maybe Daniel lived in a point of desperation. I don't know. I'm trying to get you to think deeper about what it means in your life and your emotions. Is it only when you feel at peace or, or does it... Are you really trusting God when you're feeling vulnerable? My humble opinion is perhaps the high watermark of truly trusting in God is when you're trusting God when you can't control things. You can't control a person's reaction. You can't control the weather. I'm not saying we don't have power in prayer or power in our faith, but to me, sometimes the real high watermark of, of uh, trusting God is when you feel vulnerable, just like Jesus felt vulnerable in Gethsemane, or Abraham felt vulnerable when he offered Isaac on the altar, not knowing what to expect next. Um, those places of vulnerability could be when you feel the most desperate, when you feel like your prayers aren't hitting heaven, when you don't feel like you're in control of a situation, could be the places where you are trusting God the most. What I'm trying to do with this point I don't want to lose you in all these scriptures. I don't want to lose you in the weeds. What I'm trying to do in this point is say, have you thought deeper on a daily basis about what it means to trust God? 
And when I think of vulnerability, I think of that cartoon where that, where that guy is, uh, falls over the edge of a cliff, perhaps much like this pastor mountain climber, and he falls over the edge of the cliff, and he's hanging on to one little twig, and he calls out to God, oh, God, save me, oh, God, save me, and let go, let go of that branch. <laughs> and he heard God say to him, let go of the branch, and he looks up in heaven and goes, anyone else up there? That, that whole thing. I know it was funny. You guys don't have to laugh. But anyway, uh, <laughs> listen. Sometimes, just like what he said in his story, leaning away from the mountain where you feel the most vulnerable could be the places where you're trusting God. I want to challenge you. This first point is to think deeper behind the phrase. What does it mean to trust God in your life? Well, R in the word trust is this. And I'm going to shift the message now to talk more horizontally. And it's this, the letter R, regard wise counsel in your life. Well, what does that mean? I think behind this phrase, regarding wise counsel, is a trusting God issue. Let me explain. James chapter 1, verse 5, very famous verse. I think we all live by this verse. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, and God will give you wisdom generously, without embarrassment. He will give you wisdom. Seek him in faith. Don't be double-minded. Just seek him in faith. He'll give you wisdom. Great. How does God give us wisdom? Well, that's what I want to get at here, okay? How does God give us wisdom? So, I would say on a percentage basis, at least... 50% of the time, God gives us wisdom, I call it, vertically. Directly from the Holy Spirit to our spirit to our hearts. That may come in the form of peace about a decision, revelation, a light bulb idea, um, and you just know it's from God. Uh, maybe a verse of scripture, maybe some pain in your life. Uh, maybe a circumstance, and you just know God is speaking to you and giving you wisdom. I think that happens at least 50% of the time. Maybe it's higher. Maybe it's 70% of the time. Well, what's the other percentage? I believe, and, and you could go as high as 50%. I'll even do 60-40 with you. I believe that if it's 60% vertical wisdom directly to our spirit downloading, I think the other 40%, or maybe as high as 50, maybe some of you would go higher. God gives you wisdom horizontally through other people. Gives you wisdom through other people. That's my point, is to regard wise counsel in your life. Now, so let me just give you some examples. And let me give you some negative examples. Um, so, you have a medical issue. Your health is very important. You go to a doctor. You go to a health professional. And you get some very wise counsel that will help you. I think there's a trust issue going on, not a bad trust issue. You explicitly trust their advice, their prescriptions, their treatment plan, their surgery plan, whatever it might be. You trust that, that, um, that health professional. You go to your accountant. You go to your attorney. You go to your dentist. Uh, uh, you go to a, a, a building contractor. Um, I think there's going to be a trust that you're going to receive things that are important to you that need to get done in your life. You're going to receive that wise counsel and walk with it. All right? That's a good thing. Hello? That's a good thing. When the pastor says something to you that you ought to do this, nobody's going to tell me what to do. As a pastor, when the board says you ought to consider this, nobody's going to tell me what to do. When your spouse gives you some counsel or advice, nobody's going to tell me what to do. When your kids or your grandkids, maybe one of your grandkids go, hey, grandpa or grandma, you need to learn how to text and communicate and get up to the 21st century here. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm just, the phone is good for me. It's interesting, isn't it? All I'm trying to do, it's interesting. The counsel that we receive that we never question but when somebody wants to say something to us about things of our life, 
or confirming some things we've already been praying about, we go, that can't be God. And my point is this. I think behind all of that is a trusting God issue. You know something? I get it. As I was kind of working through this point, all of us have been hurt. All of us have received bad advice. All of us have received bad information where we've been either disappointed or hurt. I get that. But one experience or a few experiences doesn't take away from this great principle that God puts people in our life to give us wisdom and direction. And my challenge in this whole trust in God issue is, do you regard wise counsel? Now, you know what? Ultimately, you have to make your own decisions. I get that too. But my point is this regarding wise counsel can really be a tough thing in all of our life. And I believe that behind it, if you're right now kind of experiencing this push away, this I don't need to hear that in my life, maybe God's giving you the wisdom you've been praying for and there's blessing in that. It's kind of like the friend on that mountain you have got to lean away from the mountain. No, that doesn't feel right to me. That doesn't sound right to me. No, I'm not going to do that. And, and it's where that friend is saying, trust me. And there's blessing in that. Can I give you a very simple sort of an offbeat example of trusting in the moment? I didn't trust God in the moment. I didn't know what was happening, but this is a people thing. This is a horizontal thing that happened many years ago. I think it was on a Saturday when we were... Uh, bringing the kids back from a soccer game. And uh, early on, driving from Amen Park to our house, um, I picked up somebody following me. And, you know, I've been watching too many Rockford File shows, and he's always picking up a tail and people following him. And so I, I remember on that particular Saturday, this pickup was following us. And I picked it up in my rearview mirror, and they turned wherever we turned, uh, and I thought I had tried to lose them, and they stayed with us. And I'm going, oh, great. I've offended them. I cut in front of them. They want to ream me out or get my license plate number. I'm thinking all kinds of negative thoughts, but we decided to just pull up into our driveway. They pulled up into our driveway. And I'm just, I mean, this is not a trust God moment. I get out. She gets out. The, the lady gets out, and she goes, we have been trying to get your attention and follow you, and when you stopped, we were going to stop because the back tire on your Suburban has got this huge bulge in it, and we didn't think you knew it, and we wanted to tell you because it really looks bad. And I'm just going, oh my word, they have been following us for several miles. <laughs> we're trying to lose them. And they wanted to point out something that would have been disastrous. Uh, and, <laughs> and, you know, in the moment, I didn't trust God in that. So, you know, I'm trying to underscore something here. Trusting God, trusting God, part of it is, do you regard wise counsel? Do you regard those messages? Do you regard them? I'm not saying you have to submit to everything that you hear. You have to make your own decisions and work out your own things in faith. But do you regard things? Because behind that, perhaps, is a tremendous blessing and a tremendous word from God. So, the letter U. T, think deeper. R, regard wise counsel. So, the letter U. I wanted to talk about perseverance, and I knew that um, uh, I, I was going to talk about Because I think perseverance and trusting God go hand in hand just like my two hands, they just go hand in hand. But U does not start with a P, so how am I going to phrase it? <laughs> Got to fit the acronym here. Got to fit into to, to my scheme. So I'm just going to say it this way. Understand your need for perseverance. Understand, deeply understand the need to persevere. Because I believe that persevering in faith is part of trusting God. Now let me give you a couple of verses a couple of scriptural examples and sort of unpack for just a couple of minutes here the need for perseverance in our lives. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, very famous verse again. Let us run the race 
with perseverance. I think that's a beautiful verse about our entire journey with Jesus. Our entire, from the moment we came into the faith, from the moment that we said yes to Christ, whether that was five years old or uh, uh, in our teenage years or maybe last year for some of you, from the moment we started walking with God, it's, it's a verse about our persevering faith through good things, bad things, uphills, downhills. It's a great verse. We've got to run the race with perseverance. The Christian life is a marathon. The Christian life is one step after another, one day after another. It is not just a flash in the pan. We know that it's not just a 100-yard dash. It's not just going from high to high. It's walking on an even keel through valleys, through hills, through mountaintop experiences. So let us run the race with perseverance. All right, that's a great verse. And then as I'm reading through the book of Acts devotionally, I came across that great, and it doesn't even sound like a spiritual passage at all. It's where in Acts 24, Paul is kept in prison for two years under the governor Felix. And for two years, it says Felix left him in prison for two years. And Felix sort of, sort of speak, used Paul, thinking that Paul would give him money and he sort of kept him in prison. He liked to talk to Paul. And Paul is probably thinking, when is this thing going to get resolved? He was left in prison for two years. Then there was a new election, put it in our terms. Uh, there was a new governor appointed in Caesarea by the name of Portius Festus. He didn't know what to do with Paul. And so Paul's kept in prison even longer. And then Paul gets kind of frustrated and says, I'm going to appeal to Caesar. Festus goes, okay to Caesar you will go. You know, I was reading that and I thought, Paul must have felt like, when does this thing get resolved? I don't even have a public defender. I don't even have my day in court. He appealed to Felix. He appealed to this other governor, Portius Festus. He appealed to King Agrippa. And I know, I know he's sensing God is using him, but this thing is going on and on and on. Am I speaking to some issue in any of our lives? This thing is going on and on and on, like a bad sermon. <laughs> I get that. Um, like, like many things in life that don't get resolved by next week. Is there a need for perseverance? Hallelujah. Yes, there is. It's, it's called trusting God. I, I just believe those things go together. The ability to trust, the supernatural ability to trust God, I think is in a walk of perseverance. So, let me just uh, challenge you to look at perseverance through two lenses. And then I'm going to tell you a quick sports story that just delights me to know in, and I wanted to encourage you. Look at perseverance from your past until today. Now, don't do it during this sermon, or I'll lose you, but at least maybe this weekend, maybe next week, maybe in some of your more reflective downtime moments. Look at your life, or just take a step back and look at your life and see how God has brought you through probably some very painful valleys, some disastrous things. He's probably blessed you in wonderful ways. And look at your life. And I want to commend you for your perseverance. If you're probably watching this message, um, you've probably been a very, very strong Christ follower, and you have persevered through some great things by the grace of God. You've persevered. You haven't given up on your faith. Maybe there were times where you got away from Jesus Christ, or you said, I want you in the back seat, and I want to run my life. We've probably all had those times. But you know what? You've persevered. And I want to commend you for that. And then secondly... Look at your life going forward. All of us have challenging things that we want resolved tomorrow or this week. Maybe you're waiting just for the new vaccine or you're waiting for all of this, the lockdown to be over and, and so forth. And we got to persevere through this and trust God and trust that God is working through all of these government and medical officials. And regardless of what news information you get, God is working in this and doing wonderful things and touching lives. We need to pray for those that are sick. My point is, look at your life going forward. Look at your life going forward. Are you trying to borrow from the future? Are you trying to 
um, instead of just taking one day at a time, one week at a time, think perseverance. Think trusting God in the midst of it. We live in such an impatient culture, right? I mean, even you can't go into some restaurants now, but just the drive through man, I need it in 30 seconds. I think that affects us. I think that's counterintuitive to this whole thing of perseverance. Trusting God, I, I think you'll be able to see, uh, you, you'll be able to see yourself trusting God more when you think persevering in things. All right, great sports story. I think I've shared this before, but it's a great one. I, I've used Jackie Robinson. Now, this is just fast forwarding into the 1950s a little bit. In 1954, there were two rookies that began their opening day, uh, made the starting lineup for opening day debut. Uh, Atlanta Braves were playing in Cincinnati. They were playing the Cincinnati Reds, and there were two rookies, one on each team, that made their opening day debut uh, in Major League Baseball. The first rookie played for Cincinnati Reds, and he, he went four for five at, uh, at the up bat, at the home plate, four for five. Did a great job in the field. His name was Jim Greengrass. Before I heard that illustration, I had never heard of Jim Greengrass. He may have, he may have been uh, a great stellar player, uh, but he certainly didn't make the Hall of Fame status. Jim Greengrass, what a great name for a baseball player. Jim Greengrass, what an opening day he had. The other rookie was on the other team for the Atlanta Braves, played in left field, made some errors, I understand, in left field, and not only that, but he went zero for five at home plate. Not a very good day to start out in Major League Baseball. His name, Hank Aaron, the Hall of Famer, Hank Aaron. I think perseverance had a lot to do with his growing success as a baseball player. He persevered, he persevered every day, he persevered in his career. But the point is, perseverance, just because you've had a bad day at home plate or a bad month or a bad, just keep persevering. It is a key to trusting God. God will do things in our walk of perseverance every day. So understand that as a deep spiritual virtue uh, in all of our lives. The letter S in the word trust is this. I knew that I was going to preach on just good old-fashioned stand on the word of God. That is a trust issue. It is in my life. It's just a stand on the word. So the key phrase here is letter S, stand on the promises. Stand on the promises of God's word. Stand on the word. Um, not stand on the premises, not stand on your feelings, not stand on the circumstances, not stand on what everybody else says, even though we want to regard wise counsel. You can, but your life can be filled with so much information, so much chatter, so much, you got to do this, you got to do this. Even those little 19 voices inside your head tell you things. <laughs> Okay, so you don't have 19 voices inside your head. Stand on what the Word of God says. To me, that is just gold when it comes to trusting God because this is His Word. This is His. We don't worship the Bible, we worship Jesus Christ, but this is His breathed Word. God gives me prophetic words that have landed in my spirit, but they no, never go against what the written Word of God says. Stand on the promises. Now, I could go on to my next point, but I want to just unpack very quickly three or four promises from God's Word that are very simple, very sure, uh, very real uh, in our life, just to give you an understanding um, of standing on the promises. First of all, stand on the promise of your salvation, the assurance of your salvation. Romans 12, 9 says, if you confess with your lips and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and that he is your Lord, you will be saved. It is, one of the, it is the greatest promise of the entire Bible. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. What a great promise. And you, you might be saying, well, you know, Ross, that's not my biggest issue right now. I'm wondering if I'm going to get my stimulus check, and I'm wondering if I'll get a job, and I'm wondering if, if um, I'll recover from this. And I get all of that, 
But you know what? We're all going to die someday. And trust me, this is the most relevant issue. You know that. This is the most relevant issue. And that twinkling of a moment, that twinkling of an eye, when, when you pass from this life into eternity, aren't you glad for that promise? That um, I believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for my righteousness and my salvation, and I will inherit all of the riches of heaven. Well, you can't beat that for a promise. Here's the second one, Mark eleven twenty four. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you are receiving it. That's a Bible promise. I didn't say when. I didn't say how. Just believe. it's a promise of prayer that you're heard in heaven. First John five fourteen. If we pray according to His will, we know that we have obtained the request made of Him. That's a Bible promise. I didn't say when they come, how they come. Some answers are no. Some are not yet. Some are, you're not ready for this. Some are whatever. But listen, God hears us and answers prayer. That is a promise. Amen. Stand on that. Here's a third one, Philippians 4.19. My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Uh, we always think of that verse when it comes to finances. I get that. It was, that was the context of that verse. But there are so many needs of life. The need of health. The need of people resources. The need to recognize that that's not a need. <laughs> the need of uh, sustaining strength. The need to get a good night's sleep. Um, there's tons of needs. That's a Bible promise. He will supply our needs. Are you asking specifically for those needs? In your life. Here's the here's fourth promise. Joshua 1 9. Great word to Joshua. Wherever you go, be not discouraged, be not dismayed, do not be frightened, for the Lord God goes with you wherever you go. Hello. You don't have to trust your feelings. You know, just trusting that nobody's here in the sanctuary. God's here. He's with me. Those are just simple, simple promises. To me, that's just good old fashioned. I'm standing on the Word of God. That, to me, is a trust God issue. No matter what people may say, no matter what my feelings say, no matter what doubts assail me, I am standing on the Word of God. I cannot resist telling you this story that I heard years ago because it profoundly affected my life. Not because I was struggling with doubts or confusion, um, not saying that I couldn't. Um, when we were at the Holy Spirit Conference quite a few years ago, we heard this very, and he was a marvelous pastor, preacher, leader. He really shared a window into his own life and, and was sharing it at the conference that years previous to this conference day, he said he was leading a revival service. And in the context of his life at that time, he said, he had gone through some real doubts. Not doubts about his salvation or whether the Bible was true, but just some doubts about maybe if God is listening to him, answering prayer. And, you know, we preachers, too, we go through struggles. And we get hit with the devil. We get hit with confusing things. We get tired. When we get tired, you get fearful. When you get tired, you get, uh, you get confusing thoughts. And he said not that anything disqualified him from being a pastor or preaching. He just felt like, oh, man. He had more confusing thoughts than clarity of faith, and he was leading this revival service. He wasn't just trying to put on a show, he said. I, he said, internally, I was struggling with some things. He was just giving us a window into his soul, which was so awesome. He just felt like it was his Gethsemane. He just felt like, oh, God, what are you doing in my life? And he said it was about an hour before he would, the service was to start, and he was in the back room of this church. And, and it was like the devil was hitting him and he couldn't find clarity of mind and thought and peace. He had been going through some depression. I'm just trying to give you a picture of what he was going through, right? He's telling us. And he said he took his shoes off. He took his Bible out. He put his Bible on the floor. He took his shoes off and he literally just stood on the Bible as a prophetic statement. And he said, God... I don't care what confusion is in my heart. I don't care what doubts are hitting me. I am standing on your word. <laughs> well, he didn't feel any different, but he had to do that 
as a statement of his declaration to the Lord. He gets out on the platform, and he said, right in the middle of my sermon, he said, tears came to my eyes, and he said, it's like heaven opened up, and he said, like the old hymn says, and glory filled my soul. He said, I just felt like I touched the hem of his garment. And he said, I think it had to do with the fact that I just literally took my shoes off and I stood on the Bible as a statement of faith and said, I believe it. I believe the promises. I am standing on the word. I'm not, if that helps you, great, because oftentimes I'll do that. But this point, the letter S, stand on the promises. So it sounds so simple. And yet you could be struggling with a lot of things in your life that um, maybe, maybe it's going to be a new level of trust in God when you say, I don't understand what's going on in my life, but I'm going to stand on your promises that you're going to take care of me. Amen? Well, the last letter in the word trust is the letter T. Well, we've already talked about thinking deeper. We've already talked about, you know, so I thought, I wanted to say something about going forward. I wanted to say something about trusting God going forward. And so I'm going to phrase it this way. The letter T is this. The best days are ahead of you. The best is yet to come. That, that old phrase, but how true it is. The best days are ahead of you. I think that's a trusting God issue, is to believe that your best days are not behind you. Your best days are in front of you. You know, sometimes you got to convince people of that because the older you get, the more you want to live in the past and the more you want to think, yeah, the 1970s and 1980s, 1990s, they were pretty good. I can remember some. And you know what? They were good, but they also had challenges. And probably in the 1980s or 90s, you were saying, oh, yeah, the 60s were the best. It's just oh, when you always reflect, they're always better. They're more legendary in the past. But true trusting in God is saying, my best days are going to be in front of me. The best is yet to come. A couple of verses, and then I want to finish. Jeremiah 29, one of the darkest days of Judah's life. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, for I know the plan. This is Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your future and for hope and not for evil. And yes, they were going to be in Babylon for 70 years. I'm not saying that you're going to be stuck in your circumstance for the next 70 years. <laughs> I hope not. Um, but nevertheless, we take Jeremiah 29, 11 to heart. I know the plans I have for you going forward, says the Lord. Proverbs 23, verse 18. Surely there is a hope and a future for you. Yes, there is. Going forward, your best days are ahead of you. And then I think of the cardinal verse of trusting God, both past, present, and future. It's Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, all things, all things, not that he causes all things to happen, but he takes all things and redeems them. All things work together for good because he is good and loves us and we're called according to his purpose. Can you take Romans 8, 28 to heart about circumstances of your past, maybe bad choices, sin failures, things that happen to you, suffering accusations, and going forward, you say, God can take all of that and work it together for good for me. He will. I get it. There are some things that we may not see the good of in our personal lives until we reach glory. I get that. I'm not here to try to answer all the problems of suffering in this message. What I'm trying to do is get you to think about circumstances and ingredients of your life going forward. The best days are... And that's a trusting God issue. So, I want to finish with the old farmer's prayer, right? The old farmer's prayer. I have been so proud it, not because I'm an old farmer, but because um, I, this illustration, and probably it was a true story, happened somewhere. This preacher was having a community prayer breakfast 
in a, in a farming agricultural community. Well, he asked one of the leading farmers to give a prayer after the meal to sort of pray for everything and everybody. And, and this farmer was really gifted at prayer and the preacher really trusted him to just deliver a great prayer for people. So the farmer, old wise farmer, gets up to the podium, to the microphone, takes his time, and he starts this way. God, you know I can't stand buttermilk. Now the preacher's got his eye open and going, what has that got to do with this community prayer breakfast? But the farmer continues, God, you know I can't stand buttermilk. God, you know, I hate raw flour. By this time, the preacher's got one. He's ready to stand up and grab that farmer and pull him away from the microphone, get him off of the platform. <laughs> but the farmer continues, and people seem to be into it. The farmer continues, God, I hate cubes of butter, and I hate to eat them by themselves. I can't stand salt. I can't stand lard. But God, when those ingredients are mixed in a bowl together and it's flattened out as dough and cut up into little things and baked for 20 minutes, I sure love them biscuits, God. I sure love them. And people got into that prayer. Because every one of those individual ingredients on their own, not good. But mixed together, they come out as pretty darn good biscuits. It was a prayer that electrified people. It was a prayer, and it's just, it's just Romans 8, 28. It is just something that should solidify our trust in God going forward, no matter what it's been in your life, circumstances, your choices, people's choices of evil against you, things that haven't worked out in your life. How about successes and things that have worked out in your life? God takes all of them and makes them into some pretty darn good biscuits. That's trusting God. Maybe you haven't seen the biscuit yet. Maybe it's still one ingredient over here. Maybe it's still in the oven. Maybe it's still... Um, uh, you haven't tasted it. It's there in front of you, but you're not convinced you like the look of a biscuit. I don't know, but I know that God works all things together for good. Trust. I hope, I hope today you're challenged to think deeper about trusting God. I know I am, just doing this message. I hope that you're thinking about messages and regarding wise counsel in your life. I, I hope that you understand a need for perseverance. Things don't get resolved just like that. That you are standing on the promises. That maybe when I just said that, you're just saying, oh God, I need to get back to just standing on what the word says. And that the best days that are ahead for all of us. Well, Father, we just come before you today. And we declare our trust is in you. No matter how we feel, we may feel at peace about some things, and that may be a sign of trusting you. Like Daniel may have slept in the lion's den. <laughs> we may feel desperate and vulnerable, like leaning away from the mountain. We may feel that, and it doesn't feel like we're trusting in you, but we are. We may feel like we don't have a strong faith because... We aren't seeing things immediately come to a resolve or an end or a healing, a need for perseverance. Thank you that your word is true. We stand on your promises. And what a great promise that out of any ingredient mixed with other ingredients, the best is yet to come. We thank you for that because ultimately that's a trusting God issue. We do trust in you with all of our heart and do not rely upon our own insight. 
Help us to grow in this trust. If there's somebody listening in right now that has never said yes to Jesus Christ, that would be a first step of saying, I trust you, Lord Jesus, to come into my life by faith to forgive me of my sins that I would know I have everlasting life. Lord, if there's somebody just listening in has just heard that, that they'd respond to you and say, I trust you. I don't trust myself, my good works for salvation. I trust you and your work on the cross for my salvation. So, Father, wherever we're at in, in our journey, whatever we're going through, we trust you, we stand on your word in Jesus' name.